quickly about bats. So um, we've been working on bats here for roughly three years or so. Sarah is kind of like, um, I consider her like my bat lead, you know, primary person in the field, that kind of stuff. The blonde girl right there in front. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and then of course all of our wildlife team helps out on this project. So including Tessa. So right there, that one. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of super cool bats here at Grand Canyon. Um, it's a super fun project. Um, learning a lot because nothing had really been done systematically here with bats. Um, ever. There's been little pieces here and there focusing on maybe a couple of different species and stuff, but we're trying to do a kind of a holistic, long-term, systematic approach to what's going on with our bat species here. So, um, yeah, just a few of our cool ones here. This is, a, this is our elusive spotted bat that we really, really want to get our hands on. So, yeah, but, um, you know, uh, yeah, big browns, pallid bats, red bats, um, and I'll go into a little bit more of this. But um, yeah, so out of all the species in Grand Canyon, our bats make up about 25%, so, which is a lot. So yeah, so they're one of the most diverse um, uh, uh, um, groups of mammals on the planet. So yeah, and we have, uh, so for every species we have that's a mammal here, roughly 25% are bat species, representing 22 total species that we know of, um, uh, different families and such, but in this area, Right where we are is the most species rich area for bats in the country, essentially, in the desert, in the desert southwest. Um, and we're right smack in the middle of it. Um, this is a cool little bat. And what is that, Tessa? What kind of bat is that? A <laughs> Putting you on the spot. So what, what is that little, like, what's that right there? <laughs> it's the, the lapid brow, that, the Allen's lapid brow. That, that, the lapid brow bat? Oh. Yeah, so I was just putting you on the spot, so. <laughs> so yeah, but um, yeah, cool little bat, cool little guy, so yeah. When you give your herp talks, you know, when you give your herp talks on lizards, you can put me on the spot, that'll be, that'll be fair, okay? <laughs> so yeah, um, so this high richness, why do we have so much of this high richness? It's because of our habitat that we have here, kind of talking about bighorn sheep, the high, you know, the elevational gradients that we have, the, the, the you know, the, just the different habitats, you know, we have cliffs and crevices, montane forests, nice, that you called earlier, <laughs> uh, riparian communities, shrublands, grasslands, deserts, we have, you know, at least 350 caves that we have identified here. So there's a lot of different habitat um, for these bats to actually make a living in. So, and, um, and we have species that focus like in caves and cracks and crevices, you know, we have hoary bats and red bats, which are tree roosters essentially. So they'll roost in trees. Um, here's crack, crack roosting animals. We have eight different myota species, which are the little guys that you see that are hard to tell apart. Um, we have eight, eight of those species and they're all, from what we know, obligate hibernators based on what we know from other systems. Um, but that's one of the things we're trying to do here is to better understand the life histories of these bats to make it more applicable to Grand Canyon to better understand what's going on. So, and then of course our famous pallid bat, which is our, uh, our scorpion eater. So yeah, yeah, which is super cool. So yeah. And again, that, the Allen's lapid brow bat. So. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, before we get to it. Uh, okay. What I was gonna say, um, is there one, is the one that was seen on the rim from alone, that, you know, dots, is that one primary bat? It could be a couple different ones, but a lot of times it's an easy thing to remember. One of the main bats that comes out early that you see a lot is the canyon bat. So yeah, Peristrellus. So yeah, it's, um, it's a little dude. So yeah, and a lot of times you see that. And then a lot, of, a lot of the myota species will come out early too. So the little guys, so yeah. Um, yeah, this, so this is just a kind of a, a cross section of the canyon just to kind of illustrate, you know, why we have such a high diversity of bat species is because we have all these different geologic layers and all throughout the geologic layers, you're gonna have different habitat types essentially. So, you know, pretty much we're up here at mixed conifer forest, you know, eight, 9,000 feet up on the rim on the north side, all the way down to the, to the warm deserts. And, you know, we're kind of at the, the junction of three of the four North American deserts right here at Grand Canyon. So you'd have this just unbelievable biotic communities here. So and incredibly diverse. So, um, 
So would you guys think that Grand Canyon is one of the most diverse places, diverse parks out there? You really wouldn't? We got yes and no. I mean, so, but it is, it really is. You know, we don't have those, the huge number of species necessarily for a lot of the species, the huge numbers of them. But, um, you know, we're definitely one of the most diverse parks in the national park system. So yeah, you don't see a lot of these animals because, you know, it's a warm desert environment for a lot of it. So a lot of these animals are, you know, come out at night or on the exact polar opposite of, you know, dial patterns, daily patterns. That's why we don't see a whole lot of these animals. But yeah, we have a, such a huge diversity in our bats included. So more bats in Grand Canyon than there are in any other national park out there. So, which is fantastic. So, um, just a few things, you guys probably already know this, but why do we care about bats, you know? So pest control, um, they eat a lot of bugs. So um, what was it up to, what would I just write? 1,200 and 1,200 an hour for like little browns. So yeah, 1,200 mosquito size insects they can eat in an hour, which is amazing. That's one bat, so yeah, which is super cool. So yeah, and they're also, you know, um, help, help uh, hold and check uh, diseases throughout the forest. They're big pollinators and such. So yeah, super cool. So these guys are um, definitely friends to us, but they also need our help because right now they're in trouble. Who's heard of white nose syndrome? All right, so most everybody, basically it's a fungus. It's caused by a fungus called PD and it basically gets on them reproduces, spreads, and actually um, will infest bats called white nose syndrome. You know, it gets all over their face, their wings. And um, basically it's an irritant. It causes them to wake up when they're hibernating, expend their energy, and then they essentially die. So yeah, because they get in super low um, metabolic rates when they're actually hibernating, if they have to wake up out of that, because they're itchy and such, it just burns so much of their fat reserves and they end up dying, so yeah. Um, and this thing has been moving very quickly, introduced in 2006 in upstate New York, and it has spread very, very rapidly to the West. And though this is the most current um, image, well, no, this is not the most current, actually. This is 2007, so we actually have um, PD, the fungus that causes the disease actually up in, um, in Wyoming right now. So, and it's, so it's, it's slowly spreading this direction. And when it actually, if and when it gets to Grand Canyon, we have a lot to lose because of our high diversity of bat species. So that's one thing we're trying to do with this project is better understand our life histories of bats and um, in a pre-white nose condition because white nose is not here, so. Um, this is when it's projected to get here, you know, right around, you know, in a few years, essentially. So, yeah, um, and it's, it's, it's on the way, so, yeah. Um, susceptible species, these are all of our species we've actually documented in the park, and we have a lot that are actually susceptible. Anything that is a hibernator, essentially, during the winter is potentially susceptible to this. So we have, you know, eight different myotis species, you know, we're gonna have, uh, Townsend's big eared, we're gonna have western bats, um, canyon bats, all these bats that are known to actually hibernate, and a lot of this is extrapolated from other areas because we don't know a lot about our bats necessarily quite yet um, for all of our species. We know it's some on some species, but overall as a population, we're still in the beginning stages of learning what's going on. So anything that's a hibernator is potentially susceptible, so. Um, so there's a couple of different things we wanna do. I'll kind of cruise through this, um, the, the, the skinny of it pretty quickly, but um, objective one, we're kind of looking at the species diversity that we have across the park. At different, at different spatial scales, we have 11 acoustic detectors set up to kind of um, essentially uh, capture bat calls um, if they're functioning correctly year round, essentially 365 days a year running for roughly a 12 hour period at night collecting bat calls. Um, and this is one of the main things we want to focus on is the winter activity period because, you know, typically if bats are getting affected by white nose they're, and they're always hibernating, they're waking up during winter and trying to forage around, trying to look for insects when there um, may not be insects and that's kind of an indicator that they might be actually infected by white nose syndrome. Things are a little bit different here, but that's kind of the, um, the, the premise behind it. 
Um, this is kind of what our detectors look like. They're not super fancy, but they run off of solar um, and designed to actually collect um, bat calls, essentially. And we're kind of like, eh, I won't even get into this, essentially. But this is the main thing that we're looking at. It's cavern roosting resident hibernating species that are white nose susceptible. So it's kind of our focus that we're looking at. We want to get a comprehensive look on all of our bats, but as far as the bat susceptible to white nose, because this is primarily a white nose project, um, we're kind of looking at the primary hibernating species. So, um, Don't need to get into this too much. This is just kind of where we have all of our sites set up, so we kind of have them. Um, we have uh, essentially four different replicants of you have you know river-based acoustic detector, mid-level acoustic detector, and RAM acoustic detector to kind of see what kind of movement that you might actually be ha having among you know the different elevational gradients and seasonal activity among the seasonal among the elevational gradients. Um, this is all preliminary data, so a lot of the uh, the acoustic or all of the acoustic. Um, data that we have right now is being analyzed by our partners with Game and Fish. And we get on average, God, I think about four, four terabytes of acoustic data a year. So it takes a very, very long time to actually run all that data and analyze all that data. So we're probably at this point close to a couple years behind on trying to um, running all this data. But it's almost done, which is great. So soon I'll be able to actually report what's going on in winter here, <laughs> which will be a great thing. So yeah, but this is just kind of preliminary work. And you see, these are all animals that are known to hibernate. So hibernate, you would not expect to have any movement during the winter, essentially. But you do have some, for some. You know, like our big brown bat right here, you have a fair amount of winter activity, you know, all throughout the, the winter. And basically, this is just, you know, the amount of activity, just the easiest way to look at it on, on, the, on the X, Y, on the, Y axis, so yeah. But you know, for a lot of species, you're what we're expecting. You know, we don't have any winter activity whatsoever. But for a handful of our, um, what is thought to be an obligate hibernator species, we are having some winter activity in pre-white nose conditions. So that's good, actually, that we're actually better understanding what our species are doing before white nose gets here. And we're saying, oh, well, they're active during winter. You know, do they actually have white nose? You know, so yeah. As far as making them move? Yeah, make like some Probably not, not, not that we know of at all. We have no reason to suspect that at all. The, but basically the take home to this is um, the life histories of some bats that are known to be hibernators are not necessarily hibernating all winter in Grand Canyon. So yeah. And with the rationale, I'm not sure exactly when I get to that, um, I can skip through that, but here is kind of the hypothesis that we actually have. Um, and the main thing to look at is this right here. So in Grand Canyon, you have these, you know, boom, huge elevational gradient, but they can, but very, very short latitudinal, you know. So they can basically go, the ones that are up here, they can just go whoosh in wintertime, and there's bugs down there on a year round basis where they can actually subsist. So unlike a lot of systems, especially back east, where the bats are in the, pretty much the same elevation everywhere. So they have no, in, that don't actually migrate, they have no um, alternative but to hibernate. Here is different, so they can actually potentially just make these movements straight down elevationally, and they can actually subsist during the winter. And so that's awesome from the perspective of white nose because they're constantly moving around. They're not hanging out in a cave or um, a crack all winter long hibernating being, you know, with um, white nose potentially coming on and actually infecting them. So it's a, it's a really, it's a good thing that we actually have this. So if that makes sense to folks, yeah. Not necessarily, so yeah. Um, I mean, it just depends on where the bat is and what they've evolved to do. I mean, we have some species like, um, well, I don't have a picture coming up, but the hoary bat, it's a tree bat, you know? And it's known to actually migrate from place to place, you know, migrate during the winter. But recent um, evidence suggests that not only do they migrate, but they migrate to hibernate. 
So there's all different life strategies out there, particular to individual bats and where they are on the landscape and geography and such. So it's just, you know, with, you know, having 25% of the world's mammals and in, in indicative here of Grand Canyon too, being bats, you know, there's gonna be all different types of life strategies. So yeah, which is super cool, you know. Bats are awesome, they're, they're super rad critters, so yeah. Um, so bat captures, so we also do a fair amount of bat capture work. Um, some cool bats we get, big browns, they're the ones that are fighters, they'll beat you up when you're trying to hold on to them. The hoary bat, actually, there's one I was just talking about that migrates to hibernate right here. Tree bats, super cool, pallid bats, which are you know our scorpion eaters. Lapid brow bats with these cool lapid brows here. So yeah, so lots of cool diversity. Um, so this is just some kind of richness. This is kind of what you would expect um, a little bit. So basically the, what this just shows is most of the abundance that we're actually do, getting during our capture work occurs during the summer months. And that just makes sense because, you know, all bats that we have are gonna be active during the summer months for the most part. So as you get into spring and fall, you're not gonna have as much activity, essentially. And um, if you look at the rim elevation, the middle elevations and the river elevations, typically you're gonna have um, more richness and abundance of bat species in these higher elevations um, to some degree, but this can also be misleading as well because if these high, if these summer, if these rim elevations, what you have is point water sources. Water source, where bats have to come from all over the place, focus on that water source, that's where we do the capturing. So as you start working your way down to the river, where we're capturing bats are creeks, essentially. And so it's a long water source and it's more difficult to capture bats there too. So um, it's, uh, it can be a little bit deceiving there. Um, so our last objective is us, we're trying to figure out what's going on with our roosts in hibernation or hibernacula. Um, so basically, a few years back, um, built this cave temperature model to help kind of guide us on whether, on where we would actually have hibernating bats. Um, the caves are getting very, they're very, very difficult to get to. So we've gotten to a handful of them. A lot of it was done by um, our physical science crew, um, which now consists of Nick. <laughs> so we've lost a lot of our physical science folks. Um, but the caves we were getting to, we're not really finding a lot of roosting bats. So the hibernacula is still kind of elusive for us. So, um, and so one thing that we're kind of wanting to, in, but out of the, the caves we did get to, um, we tried to find that nexus between optimal bat hibernation, which is a certain temperature, and optimal growth of the fungus that causes PD. Trying to find that nexus to, find, to where um, these bats would actually be affected by white nose, essentially. So, and we came up with a handful of caves, essentially, you know, right in that, you know, roughly 50 degree Fahrenheit range, and um, represented mostly in green here, and we've gotten to a handful of those caves and just haven't really found much, so yeah. Um, so we're kind of starting to look to, here's kind of the next move that I would kind of want to look at. So we do have bats in caves that hibernate, obviously, but um, this would be, considering what we have found, this would be a gigantic roost, a gigantic hibernacula. You're, what you're finding is like solo bats hibernating and such. So um, finding this with a bunch of bats together, we're just not finding it a whole lot. Um, so the next step is to kind of, there's people in other areas that have been finding hibernating bats and roosting bats in talus slopes and in cracks and crevices. And so that we have tons of that in the park. And so that's one area that we kind of want to focus on next. So, yeah. So why don't, why are you saying we don't find these massive exoduses, you know, bats since we have so many caves? Yeah, it's just, um, it might just be because we don't have as much hibernation going on is what we actually think that we should based on species out east. So yeah, and what we also have back in the east, you know, especially where we have these, or Texas, we have these huge just, you know, outflux of bats, you know, hibernating together. Um, those are the primary areas of hibernation, right? So they all go to this one area and focus on that one area to hibernate or to roost. Grand Canyon, 
we have cracks and crevices everywhere. We have caves everywhere. So the amount of available roosting in hibernacula habitat is much greater here as compared to those other areas as well. So, yeah. And I think that's all. Yeah, and so just some wrapping up. So I don't know who this guy is, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we kind of want to focus on those talus slopes. You know, this is, we're turning this into, but it started out as like a three-year um, uh, study trying to understand our bats with the relationship to white nose syndrome. We're really turning it into a long-term monitoring project, essentially. So with, our, with long-term acoustic deployments, um, we're going to continue assessing bats for white nose, and do wing and environmental sampling. So we've actually, we sampled about, I don't know, about 120 bats in the spring. You can sample them, swab them, and look for the actual fungus that causes PD. We didn't find anything, which is great. So yeah, we'll continue doing that work. Try to expand out into Western Grand Canyon, especially with the acoustics and capture work. And this is something that I want to actually try to do is just telemeter, telemeter bats, basically put little, um, little monitoring devices on them and try to figure out where they're actually going to roost, essentially. They don't last very long. You know, tops, they last, you know, maybe a month or so compared to, like, you know, the puma, the bighorn collars that last for, like, three years because it's got a huge fat battery on it. Um, these bats are very, very little, and you can only do this on a few bats because the technology hasn't gotten there yet where the telemeters are way so little that they can actually function on bats, essentially. So, uh, so we'll, but there's a handful of bats we can actually do this. Um, too. So, um, yeah, just figure out what's going on with, uh, with our bats here. That's the whole overall goal because we really just don't know. And I think that's all I have, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, cool. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Cool.